Hi, I'm Michelle Malik, and you're watching Indus Special. After the speeches at the 74th United Nations General Assembly on Friday, the 27th of September, one speech in particular garnered a great deal of media attention. That speech was by Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan. In the four-point speech, the leader chose to focus on climate change, money laundering, Islamophobia, and the illegal annexation of Kashmir by India. On today's show, we take a closer look at two of the four essential points, Islamophobia and climate change, and discuss them in the larger context of what is happening around the world. Let's begin with Islamophobia. Joining us for this discussion today, Mr. Tahir Nawaz, President of International Muslim Association, New Zealand, joining us from Wellington. We're also joined by Dr. Hidra Saputra, the Imam at the University of Hull Prayer Room and the former President of Hull University Islamic Society from Kingston upon Hull. We're also joined by Dr. Chris Galloway, communication expert, joining us from Auckland. Thank you all for joining us and welcome to the show. Mr. Nawaz, I'd like to begin with you. Now, while we're talking about what is happening throughout the world in terms of Islamophobia, how the global climate is becoming more and more hostile towards Muslims, what is your observation? What is fueling this? Uh, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I mean, first, uh, we have to recognize that uh, uh, this effect that Islamophobia is in a global rise. Uh, it's got an indication, uh, and there's a very clear indications there. Either we look at the UK, um, or we, that where the Islamophobia is continually on rise, and it's been increased in the last 10 years. Similarly, if you look at go further on Spain, um, that hate crimes are increased, that's specifically towards the Muslims, and France is on a similar boat as well. And uh, if you look at the currently what happened in, uh, in New Zealand itself, uh, attacks towards the mosque, um, uh, it's sort of controversial that it was either Islamophobic, uh, is Islamophobia or it's uh, is a racism. But in a nutshell, yes, Islamophobia, Islamophobia is an on rise. Right. Dr. Saputra, going to you, and Mr. Nawaz also mentioned the UK specifically, this is what I want to talk to you about. Now, in a report by Hope Not Hate, an anti-fascist group, more than a third of people in the UK believe that Islam is a threat to the British way of life. Now, this is different than xenophobia, it's different than racism altogether, it's very specific. Why Islam in particular? Well, um... Talking about the Islamophobia, um, why then it's Islam um, that be a victim of this? And then because the Islamophobia, uh, let's say, um, we don't know the scenario behind this. Um, I mean, like it's always if uh, there were an incident or incidents in some particular uh, countries, it's like um, on behalf. Uh, of Islam, Islamic group things, and then uh, it's always like uh, bring this, you know, um, issue because, um, you know, let's say Islam is the religion of mercy and peace. There is no radicalism in Islam. So everyone that, you know, um, uh, do their actions on behalf of uh, Islam, and it's totally against the Islamic teaching. So it cannot be, um, you know, um, uh, accepted. So it's unfortunately then it's increased the Islamophobia uh, among the Western uh, life. So this is why the Islam Islamophobia, uh, you know, uh, getting increased, uh, especially in the Western um, uh, right. environment, like UK, for example. So right. Um, uh, Dr. Saputra, I mean, like, hold on to that thought. Now, you're raising an essential point that you're trying to distinguish between what a few people do and what Islam is in general. And that's a point that the Prime Minister in his speech also highlighted. Let's take a listen to what he exactly said. How did this Islamophobia start? After 9-11. And why did it start? Because certain Western leaders equated terrorism with Islam, Islamic terrorism, radical Islam. What is radical Islam? There is only one Islam, 
And that is the Islam we follow of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There is no other Islam. Terrorism has nothing to do with any religion. Now, as we see, uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan very forcefully and very strongly makes this statement that radicalism has nothing to do with any religion, least of all Islam. Now, on that point, Dr. Chris Galloway, I want to talk to you about political rhetoric and its influence on creating certain perceptions, especially in Western and European spheres when we're seeing populist leaders make certain claims. How does that impact the uh, minds of their followers and people in general? I think it potentially has a considerable impact because the reality is that most people do not stop to deeply consider the issues. They will be influenced by headlines on TV news bulletins or in the media or what their friends tell them. And I actually think that uh, Prime Minister Khan is correct when he says that religion has no nothing necessarily to do with terrorism. Because if you look more widely, there is not just Islamophobia. It could be argued that there is a Christian phobia as well. When you look at uh, churches are being forced to put up quotations from the... In Africa, for example, in Burkina Faso, there are thousands of Christians who have been forced from their homes right. by people who are claiming to be... Uh, followers. But um, what ha gets, happens in the media is that economic and other social factors in these sorts of events tends to get hidden, and people reading about such developments tend simply to see, well, as the Prime Minister correctly pointed out, this is so-called Islamic terrorism. Right. Dr. Galloway, now on that point and talk about media coverage as well, something I do want to talk to you about is the role of language here. Another thing that Prime Minister Khan did that was very noticeable during his speech was that he tried to humanize Muslims by saying how their emotions, sentiments are hurt when people criticize Islam, criticize the Prophet. Now, in all of this, I'm talking about humanizing specifically because I want to talk to you about how media demonizes certain uh, segments of society and especially Muslims in this day and age? It certainly does in parts of the world, but I would have to say, and I'm sure that my friend in Wellington would agree, that in New Zealand, if this was ever the case, it is no longer to any great extent after the tragedy in Christchurch earlier in the year. Is the The whole nation of New Zealand has dramatically changed, including the way that the media reports Islam and Islamic um, interests and concerns. The country has um, specifically reached out to its Muslim community and embraced them, and the, there has been an embrace back, if you like. Right. So while this may be true that media in certain parts of the world, and I'm thinking of other parts of the so-called developed world, um, it demonizes Islam and uh, reports events as examples of so-called Islamic terrorism. There are exceptions, and I would like to right. say that I believe New Zealand is one. Right, and I want to jump to Mr. Nawaz on that specific and talk to him about the case of New Zealand. Now, after the tragic Christchurch incident, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, was seen to be very proactive, going out of her way, showing uh, interfaith harmony with Muslims all across New Zealand. Now, what can the lessons be learned from that tragedy, something that can be applicable to other countries as well. What needs to be done by leaders? Yeah, firstly, I think w w I would like to emphasize that uh, the leadership is the key. Um, if you have correct, right leaders, they will take that as an opportunity as what happened in the Christchurch and how the leadership of Prime Minister Jacinda, she took the whole nation to a new direction. And instead of having a hate, everybody started to love. So that's one of the best lessons I think we have learned from there, that having a right leadership and as a rise or fall of Islamophobia, it all also depends on the leader. Uh, I think we have a, a, about a month ago, we have a meeting with uh, uh, Jacinda Aron and we have a leadership uh, um, 
symposium where we have discussed about it, how we can control where things are going wrong. And one of the things was mentioned is the media that as a Muslim, we need to be more proactive on the media. And that's, we are working on it. That We want to make sure that uh, as a Muslim, we are fully um, active in media and we always uh, have our own um, right. media people as well. Yeah. Right. Dr. Saputra, now, unfortunately, it seems like the UK is the complete opposite of this. Now, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson, when he was the former Foreign Secretary, he compared Muslim women who were wearing the Islamic burqa to letterboxes. And now that he's in power, that rhetoric, I'm sure, uh, it continues to exist and influences people around them. Do you see a change? Well, that statesman, um, you know, there's very sad statement like uh, relating um, uh, like a uh, hijab, Muslim hijab and burqa with uh, terrorism things. And then, you know, um, uh, that's very sad. And then it, should be, it shouldn't be happens. And then uh, for us as a Muslim, so, you know, Islam always teaches us about peace and mercy. And then we don't react uh, uh, you know, um, to to reply that, for example, I really would love to uh, stressing uh, the lesson learned from lesson learned from the New Zealand attack. That you see, when the um, terrorism attack like Muslim Muslim in 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 the mosque, there is no um, you know a Christian phobia about that, and then a Muslim always like um, you know uh, showing a peace and mercy. Um, on this, uh, you know, um, after this incident, so we don't react like to uh, to blame Christian or against uh, Christian or attack Christians. So, you know, this is uh, the lesson learned that uh, all the world should, you know, um, should be calm down. If, for example, if there is uh, incidents like uh, done by the um, uh, wrong or misled, uh, mislead. Uh, Islamic group, for example, that's not totally, um, you know, re representing Islam. And then what happens in the New Zealand is not uh, representing the Christians. So we should uh, learn from this. And then uh, there is no relate, uh, relationship between uh, burqa and then, uh, you know, terrorism. It's, uh, you know, um, we should respect um, the, the freedom of uh, a person if they believe or for their belief uh, or for their faith. Right. Um, and then we have to back uh, on this, you know, uh, right. religion and, and faith. Right. Dr. Galloway, now what Dr. Putra mentioned here is important in the sense that he highlighted something that Muslims all across the world have been saying for quite some time now. Why is Islam equated when one single person goes out and does something? It's a double standard. It doesn't happen for white supremacists. It doesn't happen with Christians or any other religion? Why is it frequently happening? Now, what have you noticed in terms of this treatment? Do you also see a double standard in the media? This is, this is what academics would call totalizing. This is where you take an example of something happening and transfer it to a whole sector or population of people. And it's well understood, certainly here, but often not understood well in sectors of the media, that the random actions of one person or one group of people who may be considered to be extreme by most, for example, Muslims, um, are not representative of the wider population. Um, unfortunately, in competitive media environments, some media go for headlines and for presentations that emphasize the dramatic. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that the people viewing or hearing or reading these headlines tend to just absorb them and move on rather than thinking critically as to whether the true picture right. is So Dr. Galloway, to sorry to interrupt here, but this is something I want to engage with you on. Now, the media, it's difficult to understand whether the headlines they're making are their own production and they're impacting the audience or if an audience exists for those sort of certain views and that's why headlines are turned in that way. In this situation, how do we make sense of what is happening? The Ideally, what we do is adopt a critical attitude, critical not in the sense of being negative but being evaluative. 
asking ourselves as we hear reports um, as to whether we are hearing both sides of a picture, uh, of a story, as to whether there is some kind of framing going on that is slanting the reportage in a particular direction. The difficulty is that most people are not prepared to put in the mental effort that that kind of evaluation would require. This is why you get large groups of people often uncritically holding views that um, looked at objectively don't stand up. Right. Now, Mr. Namaz, as we're talking about this, of course, uh, the outcome is real lives are being impacted. It's real people whose sentiments are being heard. They're being attacked. They're being killed for their religion and faith. In all of this mess, in these dark times, what role needs to be played by community, community leaders and the community itself in trying to reach out, create awareness, or in trying to create some sort of harmony amongst the society? Uh, you know, I totally agree. There is a lot of impact because of Islamophobia, specifically where Muslims are in minority, as such as New Zealand or any uh, European country. Uh, we, our youth, our children, they're going through the identity crisis. Either they want to be have their name as a Muslim or not. Either they would be wearing uh, the girls, they should be wearing the scarf or not, because they all sort of going through a big crisis at the moment, and. It's got a special, uh, the impact is on the women, especially when they wear the hijab and they can be easily identified. And it's got a lot of psychological effect on our Muslim communities. Uh, the best thing to do as our leader, leaders that we have to make sure that we, whatever we do, is, is the, do the right thing. Because whatever we're going to do is going to reflect us as a nation, as, as, as a Muslim um, uh, and that's where we have to be very careful. Either we are Muslim in a majority country, or such we take example of Pakistan, we got a minorities there, either they are Hindus or Christians. If we're going to do anything that will affect them, then there will be the same application to the Muslims where they are in a minority. So we need to make sure that we have to act, get our act together and make sure things do things right. What our Islam teaches us, if we follow that, I'm pretty sure that would be the best example in the world. And when it comes to the majorities existing in places like New Zealand, what would you say uh, is the responsibility on their part? when it comes to treating minorities such as Muslims? Uh, um, we, I, mean, I would say that we are one of the luckiest people are, that we are in the, in the best country on the earth, where we've been treated with dignity. And it all goes back to the leadership again, because leadership they is the one they have direct the nation. And in, in our case, that was the first incident that we was being treated in that way. And the way the whole world has come together, whole nation has come together, the, and the whole leaders of the community come together, and they come and give us sympathy and empathy and all that support. It changes uh, the way anywhere else the, the world is looking at the Muslims. Now they are thinking as well. And similarly, now the Australia have a big impact once they have seen that how New Zealand have treated their Muslim minorities. Now they are sort of awakening as well and they, they're improving themselves as well. Right. Dr. Saputra, now uh, talking about European nations, a Pew Research Center st stated in a survey of 15 countries in the region that most Western European favor at least some restrictions on Muslim women's religious clothing. And this is just one example. But talking about a time in which individualism is on the rise, self-identity is being advocated for, why is it that Muslim clothing, Muslim wardrobe, that is being seen as a deviation from what society should be like. Well, mashallah, um, about the you know uh, the Islamic identity and then that it's race um, you know um, the Islamophobia and then you know as I told you like um, we have to respect 
the the freedom of faith. I mean, like whether a Christian, a Muslim, and then another religion, if they express their, you know, the symbol of, uh, you know, their faith, we have to respect. And then again, there is no relationship between these all these things with the, you know, terrorism and and things because uh, we are agreed that um, uh, no religion, terrorism is uh, no deal with. Uh, uh, you know any uh, religion because um, the majority of the religions and then especially the Islam is always uh, teaches about uh, peace and mercy so I would like to to stress two points on, uh, on this you know um, uh, issue of Islamophobia I'm afraid that um, you know there is a scenario uh, behind this that you know because of um, you know uh, among the, the leaders of Western countries, like, uh, you know, because of the hatreds of, uh, with Islam and then, you know, um, the racism with Islam. And then uh, I'm afraid there is scenario to ruin uh, the Muslim life and then to, you know, um, to, to blame Muslim uh, and then related this with every, you know, incident related this with the Muslim. And then again, the propaganda of the media. And then the best thing, the second point is the best thing to against the Islamophobia right. is with the peace and mercy. So we have to uh, right. react with peace and mercy. Doctor Saputra, unfortunately we're out of time, but you're making your uh, statements very strongly there that uh, Islam is a religion of peace, something that the Prime Minister reiterated in his speech, something that Muslims all across the world continue to reiterate. And as Dr. Galway rightly mentioned that this is totalizing a certain person with the entire uh, community, which is completely uh, unfortunate and wrong. On that point, thank you so much, Dr. Nawaz, uh, uh, Dr. Tahir Nawaz for joining us, Dr. Hijra Saputra for joining us, and Dr. Chris Galloway for joining us. We're going to take a short break. When we return, we discuss Prime Minister Khan's address to the world leaders, urging them to do more with combined effort to fight climate change. Stay with us. Welcome back to the show. Now, Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan began his address to the United Nations General Assembly with climate change. Now, in the wider context, the summit happened while millions of people worldwide had come, had come out on the streets only a week before as a part of the planet's largest climate strike. The environment was expected to be one of the main topics during the United Nations summit. But Prime Minister Khan's speech was important during all of this because it highlighted how climate change would disproportionately impact Pakistan. Let's take a look at what he says. Our country is amongst the top 10 nations in the world which are most affected by climate change. We depend upon our rivers, we are mainly an agricultural country. And 80% of the water in our rivers comes from our glaciers. Glaciers are melting at a quite a rapid pace. We detected already 5,000 glacial lakes in, in our mountains. And if this keeps going, if nothing is done, we are scared that they, we are, humans are facing a huge catastrophe. Let's discuss further how Pakistan and how the region at large is expected to be impacted by climate change and what can be done. Joining us to talk about this today is Mr. Ahmed Rafi Alam, an environmentalist, joining us from Lahore. We're also joined by Mr. Gilbert Vanakova, author of the book Toxic Capitalism and Environmentalist, joining us from Phuket, Thailand, and Ms. Bavreen Kandahari, social environmental analyst working with various global campaigns and movements such as My Right to Breathe and Student Strike for Climate Change, joining us from Delhi. Thank you all for joining us and welcome to the show. Mr. Alam, I'd like to begin with you. Now, as you heard the Prime Minister's speech there, Pakistan is disproportionately impacted. Make sense of, help us make sense of what is happening. Now, Pakistan only contributes less than 1% to the global uh, emissions, and yet it is so heavily impacted by what is happening. How is this working? Well, Pakistan is blessed with a number of very diverse ecosystems, from the Himalayan, Hindu Kush, and Karakoram mountain ranges all down to the Indus Delta. Uh, there is a variety in between. Uh, each ecosystem is uniquely threatened 
by the climate crisis that Pakistan faces. That's why Pakistan is considered so vulnerable. Not just that, Pakistan has a very large population, a substantial proportion of whom live close to or at the poverty line. And these Pakistanis are incredibly susceptible, one rain or climate event away from starvation. Right. And give us a sense of what has been happening in the recent years with weather-related disasters becoming more frequent. How is that impacting agriculture? How is that impacting the common man? Well, in Pakistan, just this year, there were unseasonal rains in April that devastated, again, not a large amount, but a fair amount of the wheat crop, uh, which impacted farmers' livelihoods. There was unseasonal uh, snowing in Balochistan in January, and literally thousands of people had to be evacuated uh, by military helicopters. Uh, Pakistan has been flooding routinely almost every year since 2010. So the impacts of climate change are there for the common man to see. Uh, Karachi, for instance, the largest metropolis, has been suffering heat waves again every year. In 2014, nearly over a thousand people perished because of a heat wave in Karachi. And I can assure you that these people weren't people who could afford air conditioners. They were very much the poor who are incredibly vulnerable in a place like Pakistan to the climate crisis. Right. Ms. Kandahari, going to you, now a lot of the issues between Pakistan and India are almost the same when we're talking about climate change, whether it's a smog, whether it's rainfall, droughts, whatever is happening. Now, Mr. Alam told us how the common man is being impacted and very much so how that's manifesting in the displacement of it all. But how do you see that this can be created in the form of awareness, information can be spread to people who are living below the poverty line, who don't see this as a threat? So, uh, so I said, um, uh, Mr. Alam has put that very clearly. As we know, and it's nothing new, we are all seeing that climate crisis happen in the form of floods and droughts, uh, you know, throughout the years and year after year. It's the same story. And... Uh, but our mostly our governments, as well as the denial, as we see, we, we don't want to believe, believe. And then the repercussions that we are now going to face, you know, or we are, you know, right now, we don't see it. Like in Delhi, we are just left with a water table of about six months now. And, uh, uh, you know, these are small examples. Or the Aravalis, we want to destroy that. The desert is coming next uh, you know, to our homes, but uh, but uh, we still don't care. We want that condo, mim, uh, condominium being made there. That is so much more important, and we want to cut forests. So so this is not going to bring us anywhere. And very soon we are going to be, uh, you know, between the f uh, the food production and the uh, you know all these climate uh, crisis, the uh, balance is going to be so poor that we will in uh, by 2060 or 55. We'll be fighting for food, so right. uh, you know. With our, you know, uh, we are yeah, because we are you know absolutely our crops uh, are dependent on the weather and uh, on right. e every. Uh, Ms. You know, Kandahar, you sorry to interrupt here, but as I'm saying, you being a climate activist, someone who has researched extensively into what is happening, will see the dangers of this. But when we're talking about it, there's something that is happening that's impacting everyone. But there is a gap in the awareness about what is happening. How do you think we should mend that gap, bridge that gap? Well, you know, there is no, I, I wouldn't say that there is no awareness. There is, uh, because there's so much, you know, you all of you are one click away, every information, every piece of information, but we don't want to believe it. We, you know, those small tree plantation drives or, uh, you know, uh, that we, want, we know that we have to segregate our waste. We know that we should not be burning crackers. You know, those are small baby steps that er people know. I mean, there, you can't say there's no awareness. There is awareness, but climate change is a very, very big term. That it's a, it's, it's something, uh, you know, beyond all this. The carbon footprint. The, uh, you know, uh, as you know, we had these beautiful agreements on Paris agreements. So all nothing is working out. There doesn't seem to be any seriousness. So, so citizens cannot do much there. You know, there's very small. If we plant 20 trees in my neighborhood, uh, or 50 trees, uh, in, maybe in my ward, that's not good enough because the government goes and cuts uh, thousands of trees in one go on a forest. So right. those policy makers have to make the difference. You know, awareness is there. 
but that will is not there. The political will is not there. And I want to come back to that point, what individuals can do and what policymakers can do. But before that, I want to jump to Mr. Gilbert and talk to him a little about what he sees as the main roadblocks in terms of Southeast Asia trying to have more, uh, more intensive uh, climate change policies, adaption programs. What do you see the main hindrances? Well, I would say that, uh, as we said before, awareness is a very important issue. But if we look at, there are actually two issues that we can look at with climate change. With climate change in general, Pakistan is not a big bad boy in the world doing a lot of CO2, CO2 emissions. So this is not the main issue there. However, when we look at climate change in general, where we go into more renewables, this is also something that can be of very big interest for Pakistan. Because as was mentioned, the climate is changing, it's heating up, people need air conditioning, they need electricity. So if you uh, depend too much on the typical coal-fired power plants, you need also a lot of water, which of course is the main issue. In my book, I said uh, earlier that when, uh, before people and countries would make war because of land, the next wars will be because of water and control of rivers. So we are coming already into, into this domain. So we have to save water, and uh, saving water can be done also by tapping more into wind farms, solar energy, biogas, but also... And a, a, a very important issue in Pakistan is to improve the energy efficiency nationwide. Uh, the national power grid in Pakistan, I know about this, I have been involved in those studies, uh, the power grid needs to be adapted. If you want to face climate change, there is one thing, is the CO2 and things like that. But then the other thing, as was commented already, is how right. can we offset the impact? And this is actually where a lot of things come in. Right. Uh, and and Mr. Gilbert, sorry to interrupt here, but one of the main things that uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan also highlighted was the need for funding and how this needs to be a collaborative effort. And to that point, I want to jump to the title of your book that says Toxic Capitalism. As you mentioned, Pakistan is not a big bad boy in the world that is creating all these emissions. There are, of course, a, a larger economic system at play. What needs to be done there? Well, like you say, uh, indeed, Pakistan is rather a victim of the whole situation than an, uh, a bad actor. But there's no point in arguing about that. The point is we have to see how can we offset the impact. Funding for all these things is really a big issue and not very easy. Industries normally are not keen to invest normally because it is not very money-making. So there is a, a, a hookup with the government needed. Uh, I've been involved a lot in what we call PPP projects, which is public-private partnerships, where we get on board uh, the private sector to help carry out certain projects. Like I said, like wind farms, solar energy, biogas, that would use less water and also be more environmentally friendly. Right. But there are other things that can be done. And I would uh, appeal to involve much more NGOs. There are a number of international NGOs who are keen to help in right. this matter. Keen to help, for example, water conservancy. But uh, you did not mention one thing, it's rising sea level. This is another very big problem right. that has to be tackled. Right, Mr. Gilbert, and you've outlined all points, and, I, uh, and they're important points, but I do want to talk to Mr. Alam a little more about what you mentioned in terms of what needs to be done uh, with private capital. Now, Mr. Alam, even in this uh, climate summit at the UN, uh, harnessing private capital was seen as a main uh, point there, trying to bring businesses on board. In that sense, what do you think can and needs to be done in a place like Pakistan, in a place like India, in trying to bring businesses on board and trying to fight the climate catastrophe? 
Well, we have to be sure here that it's business. It's a particular capitalist, consumerist and fossil fuel type of economy which has brought us to this place. And you're not combating climate change if you're not busy unbundling these three uh, elements of the problem. I wanted to just mention that beyond adaptation, what less developed countries can do, well, we have to understand that I, I completely agree that places like Pakistan and India need to focus on adaptation because our greenhouse gas emission footprints are very small. But do consider that the North Indian smog phenomenon of the last three years, which is a public health emergency throughout North India, Pakistan, bits of Nepal, and as well as Bangladesh, mm -hmm. is driven by greenhouse gas emissions that come from our transport and our energy sector. We can't just focus on adaptation. We must also control greenhouse gas emissions and avert a public health disaster that's looming in the form of air, uh, air quality. Right. And uh, Ms. Kandahari, to that, as Mr. Alam mentioned, the smog issue, we see winter coming up. And as we've seen in the past, this issue will worsen. Now, in terms of this, politics aside, trying to understand the need for regional cooperation, how important is that? Definitely this, uh, you know, the transporter, you know, we need, we need India, Pakistan and Nepal. You know, uh, we, we are speaking of wars, but, you know, we're going to have internal wars. These We are coming to situations that we'll be fighting with each other. So it's better that all of us, uh, you know, even even in, within India, we are, you know, always uh, saying that, you know, when the crop burning months are just starting, the stubble burning is going to begin now. And then we have, you know, the state borders and every state is blaming the other. Delhi's government, uh, you know, blames on the central government. So those things have to go because it's a it's a terrible situation and we will all have to uh, take certain decisions collectively to uh, you know enhance the whole uh, you know uh, you know the the whole uh, i would say it's a whole uh, you know rectification or you know this very, and it has to be very quick like we, right. said, we don't and have what time do you think now. those collective like decisions would entail making those collective moves what do you think that means uh, it means that uh, that uh, every everyone will have to leave their, you know, see, as one thing that I said is that the political will, that is immediately, you know, for your own countries. And then you have to go beyond that, because after all, we are all suffering this global climate strike, as you look. I mean, it's all over the world. Everybody's standing by everyone. I mean, you know, it doesn't mean Pakistan or Europe or America. We are all together. Everybody's been, children uh, are connected. They're so well talking about it. So when it comes to climate crisis, everyone is together. So the, our governments will have to work like that also, you know, towards the Batman. So you will have to see the uh, objective is very, very clear is climate crisis. And we're all fighting that. And we are all uh, victims. And as well as we are all... Uh, uh, responsible for this also. So right. instead of doing blame right. games, we'll have to start, you know, admitting to what we are we are doing in each country and correcting that immediately. We, because South Asia, South Asian countries are probably one of the. I think the World Bank, uh, if I'm not wrong, I think they mentioned also somewhere that we are we're going to be one of the worst affected. Right. You they know, are. Uh, they are recorded to be uh, seen as the most impacted by whatever is happening. There are the most vulnerable. To that point, Mr. Gilbert, now with all of this, with these areas and these regions being the most vulnerable, as we've discussed before, the developed nations, the European Union, the United States, China, these are large, large emitters of these emissions. Now, what needs to be done on their part in terms of funding? And what have we seen in the past happening? So, uh, I live in China, and China has invested enormously to reduce the issues of pollution. They also have water problems, not as bad as your country. Uh, what China has been doing to mitigate all this is to improve transportation. As was mentioned by the other gentlemen, uh, transportation is a very big cause of pollution. If we can uh, improve transportation through electrification, once again, we need electricity. Once again, we have to be careful how we generate the electricity. The only way to reduce pollution in this way, to reduce transportation issues, is by rail. It's the only viable 
solution. Uh, working with China would be most probably a very good idea. Uh, they are very active in building railways. They are very active also in electrification right. and also in improving right. uh, the grid. Mr. Gilbert, just quickly, I do want to also get to the point in capacity building with uh, developing nations. What are developed nations doing in that regard? Are they providing enough funding for them to actually mitigate the impacts of climate change? Uh, you are very right to point out this issue because I think the developing countries are not doing enough. However, I think bilateral agreements could be done uh, between, for example, Pakistan, the European Union, but also looking at the World Bank and looking in which areas the World Bank or the European Union would be ready to cooperate and co-invest in, in uh, certain projects. Right. Uh, China is doing its uh, one belt, one, uh, one vote. Uh, now Europe is also trying to do something. And I think politically speaking, what politicians could do in Pakistan is to bang on the door of Europe and say, well, you know, China is doing their one belt, one vote. Thing. What are you going to discuss with us? How are you going to help us to overcome these difficulties that are in due part to what you have been doing in the past in terms of CO2 generation and pollution? Right. Well, the real question here is when those doors are knocked upon, what will the response be? Will they take ownership for all of this? Mr. Alam, now, as, we're, uh, as we try to wrap up this segment, I do want to go and talk about a little of something that was mentioned before by Ms. Kandahari, which was the individual action is not enough if there is no political will. But I do want to focus on what the individual can do in this regard. No, you have to understand that the climate crisis it can't be in, uh, addressed by individual actions because it, is, it has been caused by a system, by a type of economic system, a type of consumerist and fossil fuel driven system. Uh, and individual efforts can't dismantle a systemic problem. I also want to add that people don't seem to realize how serious the climate crisis is. Uh, we've crossed 400 parts per million in 2019 for the first time in 800,000 years. And unfortunately, our international agreements, Paris, Kyoto, the UNFCC, aren't working. We aren't anywhere near reducing the greenhouse gas emissions that we need to be to avoid a degree and a half or two degrees of warming. In fact, some of the reports suggest that business as usual will take us beyond four degrees of warming. Right. That and would I, be catastrophic. Right. And Mr. Alam, I mentioned here that this is a systemic problem. It's not the individual that can solve it. But if politicians aren't waking up to what is happening, who is responsible? What should be done here? Uh, what would you do if you saw... Uh, a, a genocide taking place. If you understand that the difference between a degree and a half and two degrees of warming is almost the melting of the Himal Himalayan, Karakoram and Hindu Kush mountains and the destruction of the livelihoods and lives and histories and cultures of the people who live there, you understand that this is not just about bargaining between less developed countries or more developed countries. This is a full-on climate emergency where we need to dismantle this economic system that that's bringing us to disaster. Right. On that point, thank you so much, Ahmed Rafi Alam, for joining us, Mr. Gilbert Vanikova for joining us, and Ms. Bhavreen Kandahari for joining us. That's all the time we have for Indus Special today. We will see you again tomorrow with more stories. Till then, goodbye and take care.